uh, welcome uh, to the subnational session. So we have two presentations here, uh, and we will start with Wei Pen, uh, with a very intriguing title, uh, surprisingly inexpensive cost. When I see <laughs> these these words, uh, uh, that gets me interested. Uh, so uh, let's hear from Wei. Uh, please, the floor is yours. It's great to be in this session. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here and have the opportunity to share this work we have been uh, doing recently. So uh, my name is Wei Pan. I am assistant professor at Penn State. And this work is based on a recent paper we published in Nature Climate Change on the exact same title, The Surprisingly Inexpensive Cost of State-Driven Emission Control Strategies. We put surprisingly there because really it was surprising to us as well. So this work wouldn't be possible without my collaborators, while also I am modelers, um, Goku Iyer, Matthew Bingstad, Leon Clark, and Jay Atmos at PNNL, and also the University of Maryland. And we also have two social scientists on board for this work. Jennifer Marlin is a public opinion researcher at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, and David Victor is a political scientist at UC San Diego. So why we should focus on state-driven climate policy. To me, this is really a no-brainer because in the United States, there's no doubt that the states are actual leaders in our climate policy arena. Just to show you one metric, there are 40, 24 states plus Washington, D.C. that already have state-level greenhouse gas emissions targets, and they are showing with green and purple-ish colors on this map. And this is great because when they design their own climate policy, they can try to align their climate action with their local priorities. So for example, for California, I guess wildfire droughts are major concerns. So they're going to be part of their climate action plan. Same thing for Pennsylvania, where, where I live now, you could imagine that how are we going to manage coal miners is going to be an important part of the state climate action plan. So in short, the state level climate action is more politically feasible, feasible because they can be more aligned with local priorities. And in fact, we have seen compelling evidence that states are more reliable implementers of climate policy as compared to the federal government. And I guess the most compelling evidence is what happened during the Trump administration, even though we didn't have much uh, federal leadership back then, we did have a lot of state level action from the subnational actors back then. And to be honest with you, that was the reason why I was still optimistic during those really stressful years. But there are still problems when we look at maps like this. And that is because we still see a lot of white on this map meaning that those states are not really that engaged in climate action as compared to the other climate uh, leaders. So in other words, there are significant variations within the country in terms of their willingness to act. So I showed you the state level of GHG target. Here's another metric, which is public support level for climate policy. This is for us to think more about what will happen in the future. On this map, all those yellow states, other states with more than half of the population think the local officials should do more in addressing global warming. But at the same time, we do have those states that, in, uh, that I show in blue here, those states have fewer percent of people who think their local officials should do more. So how should we think about this variations in willingness to act? And more importantly, if you look at some of the places where they're not really engaged, where they are not willing to do more, those places are the exact places where we have low high influence. It's going to be cheaper to mitigate in Wyoming, for example, as compared to California, because California has already done a lot to clean up its power sector, transport sector, et cetera, et cetera. So the marginal cost to squeeze fossil fuel from the energy system is going to be cheaper in those states that are not doing much right now. So just to quickly recap, like really what is the motivation of our work? When we transform from a centralized federal approach to a decentralized state driven approach, we get more political feasibility, right? This is like, and also more states are going to be engaged, but how much do we lose on economic efficiency? In other words, how much more expensive is state-driven approach as compared to a more nationally uniform federal approach for the United States to achieve this, the deep decarbonization target? 
So in order to answer this overarching question, we use the GCAM USA model. This is already day three of IMC. I guess I don't need to spend too much time explaining what is GCAM, except to say that um, in our world, we use the subnational version of GCAM, um, GCAM USA, where we have uh, the representation for 50 states plus Washington DC. And the GCAM USA model is, is embedded in the global model. So there will be um, interactions both happening within the states and also with other countries beyond the borders of the United States. So we use the GCAN USA model to design a series of mid-century scenarios. And we vary mainly on two dimensions. The first dimension is the national decarbonization targets. And the other dimension is the subnational policy approach. So in terms of what, how much do we wanna do at the national level, uh, we, explored um, four levels of decarbonization, 20, 40, 60, and 80% decarbonization by mid-century relative to 2005 level. This also reflects it was an O design because the Biden administration's uh, target is now more ambitious than what we explore here. But I can talk more about that uh, in, in the later stage. And then what is more important from my perspective for our analysis is this like the other dimension, subnational policy approach. Here we want to vary the level of policy stringency across different states. And the way to represent that in the model setup is to have state varying carbon prices. So we can have, first of all, a uniform carbon price across the board. This is going to be the least cost way for the country to decarbonize. And then we also have two more approaches, which include state varying carbon prices. The last one, the heterogeneous one, is the one with the widest variation across the states. And then the hybrid one is something in the middle, where we impose also a federal level policy on top of that. I think the more important question here is that, okay, we know that there's going to be a state variation in their policy stringency, but how exactly we can represent that in a realistic way in models? And this is where social science is coming. So in the social sciences, we have evidence that there's a positive correlation between the public support level for climate policy and how much the states wanna do. So in other words, usually the higher is the public support rate, the more stringent policies the government can implement. But the question is, what exactly is the shape of that relationship? So the way we think about that is that, first of all, the heterogeneous um, scenario, which examine the widest variation across the states, we want to represent how states are making policies. And there is good reason to believe the shape between public support and how much the states going to do is not going to be linear. And the main reason is that um, usually in a democracy, we need to convince half of the population in order to pull the trigger. So we call that median voter theorem. And to represent that in this setup, we assume that we, after you reach half of the population, support climate policy, there's going to be a steep increase in how much more stringent the policy could be. So that explains this, this like steep part of the curve. And then for the hybrid approach, as I mentioned before, what we wanna do here is that we wanna first impose a, left, a, a federal level policy that all the states should do at the minimal effort. And then the other states like the California, New York, Colorado, if you want to do more, of course you can do more. So that is why the shape is going to be a floor level of policy stringency. And then if you want to do more, feel free to do so. Then num numerically, the question is, how can we set that floor level? And this is where an understanding of the federal policy making process is important. So here, we uh, set the floor level as the 40th percentile of all the states. And this is because in the US Senate, we need 60% of the vote in order to pass the legislation. So in short, um, using these, uh, incorporating some of the social science insights, what we established here is two relationships, how public support level is going to affect the policy stringency level at each state. So just to uh, give you some maps. So visually, this is the public support level across the United States in terms of percent adults who think their local officials should do more. 
And the darker is the color, we have larger percent of population who have stronger support for climate policy. And using the relationship I showed you on the previous slide, we translate that into the relative ratio of carbon prices um, in different states. So for example, um, there are variations across states. The highest support level was in Washington, DC. So here, the number, the numerical numbers I show you here is the, is the relative ratio in each state in terms of their carbon price as compared to the highest price um, in Washington, DC. So we have a lot of states in blue. Those are the states have higher support for climate policy. So they have higher carbon prices in our setup. And we, but unfortunately, we also have a lot of states in red. And those are the states they have lower support for climate policy translate into lower carbon prices um, uh, in those states. And here, as you can see, the whole range in terms of the variation in carbon prices across the country is a factor of three. So the lowest carbon price is just one third of the highest carbon price in Washington, DC. So with this relationships, what we did in the model is that we first set the relative ratios of the carbon prices for the 50 states plus Washington, DC based on the public support rate. That is, that is essentially my second panel here. And then we let the model solve the whole set of state carbon price levels in order to meet the national decarbonization targets. So this is how we combine those two dimensions on the national decarbonization target and the subnational um, policy approach. So now it comes to what we find. So first of all, this is really our main question, which is how much more expensive is the state-driven approach? So this is the, the overview of the results. What I show you as the bars here are the mitigation costs in 2050 as a fraction of projected GDP in 2050. And here, a different color represent the low, medium, and high supporting states, corresponds to the map I showed you just now. So what we find is that, of course, when we increase from 20% decarbonization to 80% decarbonization is going to be much more expensive. This is confirm what, to confirm what others have already found in the literature as well. But really our focus here is that comparing the heterogeneous and hybrid approach to the uniform approach, we actually don't see the nationwide cost increase by too much. So in other words, nationally, the state-driven approach is only 10% or less more expensive than the uniform approach. And why is that? This has a lot to do with the allocation of the mitigation cost. So if you look at, if we changed from the uniform approach to the heterogeneous approach, the cost is going to decrease in the low supporting states and increase in the high supporting states. So overall, the net increase is now going to blow up. But I get this is not a perfect answer. I'm sure a lot of you will also ask this follow-up question, which is then why the cost increase in high supporting states is not extremely high. It's not going to like be much, much more than the cost reduction in the low supporting states. So this is where looking into which sector actually mitigate would give us some insights. What I'm showing you here is the reduction in CO2 emissions in 2050 relative to 2050, uh, 2050 relative to 2015. And if you look at the low supporting state, what you find is that suppose we have 80% decarbonization target at national level. When we move from the uniform approach to the heterogeneous approach, the low supporting state are going to meet, meet, mitigate less for, uh, because they have lower support level and lower carbon price. And those differences mainly occur in the electricity sector and also the refinery sector. Same thing will happen in the high supporting states, but the opposite direction. So when we, when we move from the uniform approach to the heterogeneous approach, the high supporting states is going to do more. And that mitigation mainly occur again in the electricity sector and also the, res the, the refinery sector. So this really leads to the, the why part. Because the electricity and bioliquids market are linked across the states, for the electricity sector, uh, in the model, we model 15 a regional grid within the country, 
we assume certain trade across different regions. And also within each region, we assume perfect transmission across the states. And also for the bioliquids market here, we assume large flexibility in terms of like moving those bioliquids around. And because of those important assumptions, this allows high supporting states to tap into lower cost options in other states so that the cost mitigation costs in these states are now going to be extremely high. But as we wanna really also understand more about is there going to be condition when the state-driven approach is going to get extremely expensive? And that led to a series of sensitivity analysis we did. So the first three bars I have here were the exact same results I showed you just now for 80% decarbonization, uniform hybrid heterogeneous using red, yellow, and blue showing low, median, and high supporting states. And these are the mitigation costs as a percent of GDP in 2050. So what we find is that no, under most alternative formulations of policy heterogeneity, or other technology assumptions, we're not going to see state-driven approach much, much more expensive than the uniform approach. Even though, for example, when we limit the electricity infrastructure, limit CCS or limit biomass, it's going to increase our overall cost, but this is not, go not going to change the relative change, relative difference between the uniform approach and the heterogeneous approach. However, some of you probably have already seen these two bars that really stands out. In other words, yes, there are situations when the state-driven approach will get extremely expensive, and that's what we call 3-0 and 5-0 here. And these are the scenarios when we assume three or four lowest supporting states are not engaged in climate action at all. The carbon price is set to be zero. And this is going to be important for the cost because now the climate leaders need to adopt really expensive negative emissions technologies in order to compensate those climate leggers who are not doing, doing anything in their own states. So just to quickly summarize what we find in this analysis, we find that the nationwide cost from state varying climate policy in the US is only roughly 10% higher than the nationally uniform policy. This is surprising to us because we actually expected a higher number than 10% when we started this analysis. So the promising side of our finding is that the benefit of state-led action for example, the practical reality that states implement policy more reliably than the federal government do not necessarily come with a high economic cost. And really the key factors to keep the cost low are interstate trade and minimal efforts from everyone. But what could go wrong in the real world? Usually, you know, the model world is too perfect to be true. Anything? And more importantly, the two factors I was describing just now might go wrong. So in the real world, we observe inflexibility of energy investment and trade for regulatory, political, physical reasons. And also it's a critical question, can leaders really inspire followership, especially in those days who really don't wanna to do too much? So this is why there's an ongoing research agenda that me and my colleagues, especially David Victor and others are working on which is we need to think more carefully about incorporating this real world considerations in our modeling world. And David Victor mentioned, like spent his plenary session on this topic. And um, I don't wanna spend too much time on why it's important and why it's also challenging, but I will just end my presentation to say that this is an active field of research um, of ours. And I really look forward to uh, more discussions with those of you who are interested in this dimension. With that, thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, now uh, let's switch to uh, another presentation. Uh, Evan Arbuckle uh, has another intriguing uh, talk on uh, regional heterogeneity of hydropower in Canada. So Evan, please, the floor is yours. Uh, so yeah, hi, my name is Evan Arbuckle and today I'll be discussing uh, subnational hydropower modeling with GCAM Canada. I'm a University of Alberta Future Energy Systems researcher, and I'd like to acknowledge support from my co-authors at the Joint Global Change Research Institute and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, so a, a bit of background about electricity and hydropower in Canada. Um, hydropower currently makes up something like 60% of Canada's total electricity generation, uh, which gives it a very large share of renewables uh, compared to most other countries. 
um, hydropower has and will continue to play an important role in Canada's energy, agriculture, water resources, and other systems, but it's often overlooked in modeling work, usually because it's been very challenging to locate and quantify the remaining resources and development costs, uh, which are very different region to region and depend strongly on local conditions uh, like topography, geology, uh, and climate. Um, so in Canada, electricity systems are largely uh, regulated by the provinces. Uh, so decisions about whether to proceed with hydropower development are typically made at uh, local levels, making modeling uh, with subnational detail kind of more realistic considering how decisions are made in the real world. Um, so like the presentation before me, we've been uh, developing a version of the Global Change Analysis Model or GCAM uh, to improve spatial and technological representation, but this time for Canada uh, and calling this GCAM Canada. So GCAM connects energy, land use, agriculture, water, and climate systems to explore alternative future pathways. Uh, the model solves for markets in five-year time steps, proceeding from past calibration periods uh, as far as 2100. So in previous work, uh, we've developed the first endogenous national representation of hydropower in GCAM. And now we're extending that to the subnational level. So uh, our research questions are what role might hydropower play in Canada's future electricity systems? How's that growth uh, affected by electrification and climate policy actions? And we look for insight as to which regions of Canada are most likely to see hydropower growth. So the heat map shown here shows the 13 provinces and territories of Canada uh, by their existing hydropower generation. So uh, much of the generation currently comes from the French-speaking region over here in the east uh, called Quebec, and then quite a bit also from British Columbia, which I'll call BC from now on, uh, which is sort of the mountainous and rainy area along the Pacific coast. Uh, and then there's quite a bit uh, less generation sort of elsewhere in the country. So a uh, quick overview of the methods. Uh, first, we had to regionalize all the data by establishing uh, consistent subnational regions and attributing historical and existing hydropower uh, generation to those areas, uh, along with estimates for resource potential and development costs. Um, and then uh, some model developments were conducted to enable endogenous hydro at this level. And finally, we developed scenarios of interest, ran, ran model simulations, and conducted analysis. Um, so for regionalizing the data, we defined 35 subnational regions for Canada based on the borders of provinces and territories, uh, intersected with uh, the way that major river basins are already used uh, for GCAM's water sector, as numbered in the map here. Uh, we based this from data for hydropower potential along half degree square grids produced uh, in a previous paper by Yu Yu Cho et al. Uh, using GIS tools, uh, and they considered things like uh, land-based constraints like urban areas and national parks combined with sort of um, hydrological and topographic things that go into what makes uh, a good site for hydropower. Um, so the resource data were then processed to generate cost supply curves for each subnational region, uh, revealing large spatial variation in resources and economics. So uh, looking at the, the figure here, you can see that kind of this yellow region has uh, very steeply escalating costs uh, and relatively few resources. And then something more like this blue region uh, shows that it's a little more expensive to get into at first, but there's quite a few more resources. So things will kind of develop there later sort of as needed. Um, so we allocated uh, resources in the model with a nested structure so that provinces determine uh, how much hydropower they get first, followed by competition between uh, internal basins. Um, so that aligns better with the way that developments are usually approved by provincial jurisdictions in Canada. So the province will decide, okay, we want hydropower, and then they'll talk about, okay, where do we put it? Um, so yeah, it's important to note that uh, Hydropower competes against all other technologies for market share in the model. So it's, it's going up against wind power and solar and everything else as well. Um, and the model isn't trying to optimize so that non-market preferences for uh, things like political or social regions are captured in uh, historical periods by calibration parameters. Um, so for our results, we have three scenarios based on climate policy ranging from no policy to net zero by 2050. 
the no policy scenario removes any climate policy measures from future periods so that the model generally allows um, the market and calibration to influence decisions. Uh, continuing policy applies some major Canadian federal climate policies in place as of 2020, including a coal power phase out and carbon price and net zero solves by constraining the model to net zero GHG emissions by 2050. Um, so we'll go through a few of the results quickly. Um, the scenarios here um, are just some of the cases used for my uh, thesis work, which is not yet published. Um, so this is electricity generation for each um, scenario. Um, the net zero scenario shows considerably more electricity demand growth as a result of electrification in other sectors, uh, mostly from industrial processes. So uh, shown here, kind of the more stringent climate policy uh, results in more reliance on new hydro development, as well as uh, other renewables like wind and solar. So in these higher electricity growth scenarios, hydropower is relied upon as a significant source of new development. Um, and this shows that kind of the resources are there and they remain sort of competitive. Um, so then just zooming into uh, the location of some of where those hydropower uh, resources show up, um, most of it kind of continues to develop in BC and Quebec, while uh, other areas of the country see more modest growth. Um, and then the figure here just shows kind of some of the extremes in the types of uh, regions uh, for Canada for new hydropower development. Um, so the Quebec Hudson Bay Coast region here is able, even with high demand growth, to continue ramping up generation due to its high resource potential. But the neighboring uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Churchill Basin develops sort of only a little bit more before hydro resources are essentially exhausted and plateau in the near term for any scenario. Um, so for another example of how subnational modeling helps improve the realism of the results, we can look to uh, Canada's remote Northwest Territories, uh, which are shown in red on this map. Uh, this is an area with very low uh, local demand, harsh climate, and very long distances between uh, communities. So for scale, there's about 45,000 people spread across an area the size of the nation of Colombia. Um, so the resource potential in this area is found to be almost half of the total national uh, sort of resource potential of uh, about 1900 terawatt hours. So despite that, um, the way the calibration works, uh, how we've set this up, the model simulates a little absolute growth in this territory. Uh, less than two terawatt hours, even with net zero by 2050. So the subnational modeling helps to prevent sort of development of inaccessible resources that might otherwise be considered viable if this was a national model. Um, so there, there's a few ways this work uh, could be built upon. Um, we've applied subnational capabilities for hydropower only on the supply side so far. Um, our research team is nearing completion of a regional GCAM Canada which will allow provincial analysis of all energy sectors for both demand and supply to get a proper link between uh, provincial demand and supply. Um, so my colleague Diego Shapori has uh, poster 178 uh, for more information about that. Um, so the data sets produced for Canada could be incorporated into other IAM or energy modeling work and the methods could be adapted to other countries as well. Um, and in terms of potential model development to take this work further, um, hydropower is not yet linked to model water consumption and withdrawals, uh, partially because there's not a lot of uh, consensus on how much consumption of water hydropower causes um, and changes considerably from climate to climate. Um, and then we could also um, link more subnational electricity trade uh, that would sort of help to improve uh, how the trade looks in the model. Um, so in conclusion, a novel set of historical and resource supply data have been developed to allow for endogenous modeling of hydropower in GCAM Canada for 35 subnational regions. Uh, in parts of Canada, hydropower resources remain competitive options for new electricity generation development with higher deployment in scenarios with higher electrification. Uh, and the regionalization really allows for sort of better model calibration and responses, uh, for example, by limiting development in the areas with high supply but low demand. Um, and the results indicate likely areas for growth, considering resource potential, costs, and other factors with high growth simulated for BC and Quebec, uh, 
and modest growth for most other areas of the country. Um, so there's just some references. Uh, with that, I'll wrap up my presentation. My contact details are on screen and thanks for listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Wei, uh, you did an advertisement that, oh, uh, you may say something about 100% reduction. Uh, I'm really interested in <laughs> what, you, what you have to say about that. Uh, and let, let's start with that. Yeah, um, thank you. So let me start with the more, more earlier version of model, which from my perspective, wasn't ready for solving net zero system. The reason being that like from where we are today, like we use a lot of fossil fuel, people may think that 80% decarbonization is not too different from 100% decarbonization, but this is wrong. Because when you go from 80% to 100%, this is where you really push the system to the extreme. There will be a lot of residual emissions from the harder to abate sectors, and we really need good representation of what can be done in those sectors. And also the negative emissions technologies, such as bioenergy with CCS, as well as, um, as, well as the direct air capture, in order to make sure that we can not blowing up the system by really making sure that there are like some pot, we can still leave some positive, but at the same time using the negative to cancel them out. So from that reason, I think the model I was using wasn't ready for that. But luckily the team, not really me, but Goku Ayer and others at, at jQuery are developing a model right now for EMF process. And those models will be like, they. I think their plan is to release next year, but I don't wanna say on behalf of them. And I think that model version will have much better representation of how to evade sectors and also negative emissions technologies. So I personally are very excited about that model development. So that's the more boring side because it's technical, it's about the modeling side. And then the more exciting part I want to share is that we actually did using our model to run a 95% decarbonization run, which we included in the supplemental information. And what we find is that, first of all, because what I mentioned just now, the lack of representation of those really important, like pivotal technologies, um, we're going to see the cost being like almost half at almost twice as expensive when we move from 80% to, to 95% because of that. But we didn't find huge difference, again, between the uniform approach and the heterogeneous approach. In other words, even we were using an old version of a model, we confirm our main finding, which is even in that extreme scenarios, if we have trade and if we have the engagement from the climate laggers, we can still go for a state-driven approach without losing much of the economic efficiency. So that's basically what we find. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also have a question to Evan, but I see that uh, uh, we have a, a raised hand. Uh, so Kevin, uh, if uh, you uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, hi, Evan. Uh, thanks a lot for this presentation. Very interesting. Um, I'm with ECCC, and uh, I was wondering about the responsiveness of the model uh, for hydropower development um, in terms of the political versus policy choices. So political preferences versus policy choices. Uh, looking at the current development of the Site C hydroelectric facility here in BC, we see that um, a hydroelectric build out is, is a very political and, and, and social uh, uh, guided decision. So I was wondering how you uh, manage that trade off in the model, because uh, we know that for some other technologies like the solar PV uh, model can be very responsive to, to policy choices, but how do you deal with that? For, for hydropower where the political preference is such a dominant uh, force? Sure, yeah, good question. Uh, so uh, in, in general, we're not sort of directly, you know, trying to capture exactly what the, the political sentiment is, is uh, at the time. Uh, so for instance, um, you mentioned Site C, which is located in sort of the Mackenzie Basin of uh, BC. Um, so the model uses um, these sort of calibration parameters called share weights that sort of indicate relative to other uh, areas in the model, um, which kind of have been developing based on like the resources they have and what costs they're at. Um, so essentially extending that into the future, what we're saying is that, um, you know, Quebec has been developing a lot of hydropower in the past, um, and therefore it's sort of more likely to continue doing that than other areas. Um, so if there was sort of a big political shift, like, um, you know, Alberta decides to build a, a huge hydropower dam, uh, we wouldn't represent that very well. Um, 
Yeah, so it, it's, it's kind of um, used as part of the calibration, but not super directly, I guess, is my answer. Okay, makes sense, thanks. Uh, Evan, uh, another question. Well, in my home state of Massachusetts, uh, we are thinking actually of tapping to some hydropower from Canada. I know that uh, uh, it's been, uh, I think, a deal announced by New York City uh, also getting there. So uh, my understanding that you have a Canada model. So what is your thinking if you are going to expand that to the US? Uh, uh, well, do you have enough hydropower to power Massachusetts or uh, any other things? So, well, more, 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 more seriously, how, how, how do you see uh, the results changing if you allow uh, for that additional demand from your southern neighbor? Sure, sure. So one of the interesting things that seems to be happening, and so right now we're only dealing with electricity trades sort of between Canada and the US as a whole. Um, so it's not showing sort of any nice results sort of region to region. Um, but in the sort of higher demand scenario, um, we see more electricity trade from Canada to the US. So um, partially there is more hydropower development in Canada to help the US get to its net zero. Um, so, and one of the things that does is there's sort of an asymmetric um, cost sort of effect where um, Canada's electricity prices are sort of inflated a little bit, a little bit by that as we sort of start heading to more uh, marginal resources, things get a little more expensive. Um, but right now, prices in Canada are quite a bit cheaper, especially compared to somewhere like Massachusetts. Um, so it would tend to probably sort of bring Canadian electricity prices a little more in line with some of the more expensive areas in the US possibly, whereas um, the US, Canada is a fairly small contribution kind of even in that situation. So their prices may not sort of drop a whole lot if sort of a lot of Canadian electricity comes into the market. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, uh, but before I see that way, you also have a question, but before you do that, I have a question to you. So I'm, uh, correct me if my thinking is, uh, uh, is wrong. So what you are showing that um, the overall uh, policy cost for the US is not changing. But um, what I was uh, thinking of uh, looking at your presentation, maybe you have those results. Well, but how the costs like state by state are changing, right? Because, well, it's like you're measuring average temperature in the hospital, right? So, well, it may not change that much, but well, you're going to have well, some people dead. So is, is it the same story that, yeah, you're averaging because, well, uh, like California or some other big players uh, are really dwarfing the results, but maybe West Virginia or Wyoming, well, we are killing half of the economy which is not going to be an acceptable answer. So can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I can do more than that because I have the privilege of being able to share my screen. So this is exactly to answer your question, which is yes, nationally, it doesn't change that much, but we can clearly see how the spatial distribution are going to shift. So this is a uniform approach, not surprisingly, that is cheaper to mitigate in the Midwest, so uh, we're going to mitigate more there if we have a uniform carbon tax, leading to a higher percent of mitigation costs as a ratio of GDP in those places. Things will look different if we go for a heterogeneous approach. It's not going to be those places that have highest mitigation costs. Now we are moving to like the other part of the country who on the one hand usually are larger, have larger emissions, and also like usually a, 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 like from the economy perspective, a little bit richer as well. So um, there's a lot of important equity questions here. So I really think the key point to like get to, to, you know, in a modeling world, you can get whatever results, that's an exaggeration, but you can get different types of results depending on how you set the relative carbon prices in different states. But I think a more important question is how we can use the result to inform the different typology of states in terms of coalition forming and actually building like this interest group where a, a, a group of states who are interested to do more thank you that's good uh and now well you, you have the floor uh, it looks like you raised your hand so it looks like you have a question to, to evan yeah i do have a question to evan but i felt that i've talked too much um evan i'm really curious about your um 
results, whether or not you also can see the land use implications. Um, because, you know, the, for the national model, a lot of people are criticizing like some of my work, for example, that we don't really consider the land use implications, especially whether or not this land can be converted to the other purpose. So I wonder if that's part of your like consideration in your work. Sure, sure. Um, so it, you know, we do see in sort of the higher uh, emissions constraint scenarios that um, the model really loves BECs um, and sort of tends to shift things toward um, biomass. Um, and kind of to the extent that we think it's a little bit excessive how much land is being converted for uh, biomass. So in our net zero constraint, we did actually include sort of just a an upper limit on how much biomass can be used just in terms of like exajoules produced for energy just to prevent too much of the, the land base getting converted for that. Um, so that, that's kind of the main way that we looked at it. Um, but other than that, uh, we basically kind of allowed it to um, resolve the way it normally would, I guess. Yeah, I think that's important. Yeah, and it's extremely important because, yeah, as all of you know, the model allows these uh, wonderful solutions like character capture or bags, uh, which gives you a cheap way out. And how realistic they are, well, that's still to be proven. So you have to be really careful with those. Uh, results. Uh, great session. At least I've learned a lot and uh, I think it was a very good interaction. So thank you very much.